Hello. Firstly, I'd like to thank a few people. I'd like to thank Professors Richard Green and Bertolt Scherner for, for making this inaugural lecture happen uh, during this difficult time of COVID. Uh, and I'd like to thank Lucy Simpson for uh, all her support on the technical side uh, and without whom this, this wouldn't have happened. Um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank Professor Julie Scott Jones, my line manager, for the support I've received at uh, Manchester Met since I arrived here. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, our Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Malcolm Press, um, for, for giving me this opportunity here uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, you'll be hearing shortly from um, Sue Backhouse, um, Professor Backhouse, who uh, uh, has been a, a great support to me in particular in, in recent years. And I'd like to th thank her for doing this, uh, but also for those other things that she's um, helped develop my career with. Um, I I'm not going to make this a huge list of thank yous, but there is just one other person uh, I'd like to mention. And there'll be other people I'll mention during the lecture. Um, uh, and the person I want to mention in particular is uh, Dr. Diana Layton uh, for all the help and support that she provided to me during my time at Liverpool John Moores University and for, um, I suppose, being a, a model of academic integrity um, uh, and, and she really is um, a, 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 a massive contributor uh, to, to research within uh, that university and uh, her influence continues beyond that. Um, I, I'm going to talk about myself, basically. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, my, my background, but mostly focusing on the, the work that I've been engaged in, in particular that work around um, working with anabolic steroid users. Now, anabolic steroid use is, is nothing new. Uh, it's been around for the best part of 100 years, um, uh, and certainly since the 1950s, uh, being used uh, uh, illicitly within um, uh, strength sports uh, and bodybuilding. Um, but my focus uh, of work is, is its use within the general population. Uh, that Since the late 1980s, we've seen this uh, diffusion from um, the elite bodybuilding uh, through to uh, gym goers. Um, and that might be my main focus uh, of research, which I, I'm going to touch on. Um, to start with, um, this, this, this is me. Um, I was born in 1963, uh, and I was a studious little chap then, um, which is um, ironic because uh, I didn't do that well in school. In fact, uh, I left school with little more than a dislike of cor corporal punishment uh, and a few good mates. Um, I then spent some time in uh, a career that there's no need to go into at this stage. Um, and then moved into nursing. I, I uh, trained on the Wirral as a registered general nurse, and this was a, a, an interesting time. Um, in the 1980s, um, it was we saw um, heroin sweep across the cities, uh, particularly the cities of the north of England. Merseyside was particularly badly hit, uh, and, and the Wirral, uh, north end of Birkenhead, um, uh, and the big estates uh, on the world, well, as some of the uh, at that point, some of the biggest estates in Europe, and um, heroin had a, 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 a massive a detrimental impact to, to, to those communities. So that was the backdrop of me going into nursing, uh, and the the cultural backdrop you can see from um, the uh, headlines of the, of the local papers and national papers at the time, and the focus on on heroin in particular places like uh, on the Wirral. Um, what it showed me was not just the negative impact of injecting heroin use, um, but it also highlighted some of the shortcomings in healthcare uh, that this vulnerable population were receiving. Um, and, and this was reinforced when I, I worked in uh, Liverpool in, in theatres. And um, uh, not not on the stage, uh, uh, operating theatres, um, and w I suppose the the healthcare that they received, um, I, I wanted to make a difference. Um, we saw horrific injuries from from injecting. Um, 
uh, things like broken needles uh, embedded in femoral vein, uh, entry into the femoral artery. Um, we saw lots of gangrenous legs, amputations, stuff like that. And, and I wanted to go upstream. And that's what took me to the Maryland Centre. And the Maryland Centre was a needle, needle exchange uh, programme, uh, or syringe exchange programme, things what we called it at the time. And it, it was one of the first, um, certainly one of the first in, in the UK, and it was uh, pioneering its work um, uh, of give, providing joined up care of primary health care, uh, of specialist care, uh, and sort of wider social interventions to um, so, some of the most needy and, and damaged uh, members of our community. Um, and that, that w was what took me there. But what I found there was it was something different. The, the majority of the, the clients were injectors of, of heroin or, or increasingly injectors of crack cocaine as well. Um, but they didn't all look like that. Um, and admittedly, very few of them look like that. He's an exceptional chap. This is uh, Dorian Yates, and I'm not suggesting for a moment that he used anabolic steroids. Um, but that's what people aspired to be. The, the majority of people who were presenting uh, in relation to injecting anabolic steroid use had aspirations for this kind of physique. Um, it was the, the, the time of the, the giants, the, these huge uh, bodybuilders. And what I quickly discovered was that they didn't just look different. There were other differences, you know, it, different uh, drugs, different ways of using the drugs, different uh, drugs market and the, and the way people acquired their drugs. Um, the characteristics were different. Um, this group were, were much more health conscious. Um, but they had some commonalities, in particular around poor injecting technique, uh, localised infections, abscess formation. And these are things that this is, I was going to say bread and butter, but you shouldn't say that next to the term abscess. But this is the bread and butter work of, of a harm reduction nurse, uh, dealing with those injuries, but also trying to change behaviour. And to do that, you need to understand the population. And there was very little literature out then uh, around anabolic steroid use. There was the, the genre literature, as we class it now, uh, the underground steroid handbooks, which many users either had or, or had access to. Uh, and there were a few good um, academic texts. But in, in some ways, this was, this was the, the, the making of my research uh, career, because there was no alternative but to actively engage with the target population to find out what they were doing, why they were doing it, the rationales, the, the circumstances, um, the events and the consequences. These were the things that I needed to understand. And it, the only way of doing that was through talking to users. And the best way to do that was through uh, access uh, to some of the influential gym owners. And, you know, I'll, I'll always be grateful for the likes of, of Bill uh, and Jeff uh, in Merseyside at the time, who, who were very patient. And I think Jeff in particular talking for long periods of time uh, about um, the, the, the community uh, which he was from and, and letting me have an insight. And I wasn't part of that community. I was an outsider and, and, the, and that trust of letting me understand their world. And, and this has continued throughout my career and more recently people like Rab, who, who's been very patient uh, uh, and, uh, and given me lots of his time and understanding around the issues of uh, anabolic steroid use within the gym community. Um, at this point, it got me interested in data as well, because it was plain to see there was an increase in this population. And at the time, we just started um, using a monitoring system. Um, so I, I was contributing to this monitoring system. Um, within a few years, I was um, engaged in responsibility for this monitoring system from an academic point of view. This is uh, how it got me interested. Uh, and of course, it showed, um, as predicted, uh, within a, a decade, um, there were more new um, anabolic steroid users compared to heroin users. Uh, and the other thing which, prediction which, 
came to pass was that within another 10 years, there'd be more um, anabolic steroid users as a whole than heroin users. Uh, and that seems to be the case. And it's certainly the case amongst the clients uh, of syringe exchanges in um, the north of England. Uh, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Um, what I did from the Maryland Centre was uh, moved to the Drugs and Sports Information Service, uh, and that was uh, run by Pat Lenahan. Again, he was very influ influential in my uh, development of understanding of anabolic steroid use. So I, d despite my naivety uh, when it comes to research, um, I was involved in some really uh, groundbreaking uh, work while I was there, um, looking at um, the, the population um, what they were doing, who they were, um, uh, and some of the, the consequences. This was the largest study uh, of its um, uh, kind in Europe at the time, uh, with interviews of 400 steroid users. Um, it also um, gave us an opportunity, what we class now as um, re research impact, uh, although we didn't class it as that at the time, it was about the applying the research findings to policy and practice, and we did that uh, to good effect. Um, I moved to the University of Liverpool um, w with Mark Bellis, uh, and then from the University of Liverpool, still with Mark Bellis, to Liverpool John Moores University, and he was a big influence um, uh, on my development as a, as a researcher and as an academic. And while I continued my interest in the subject of anabolic steroids, um, my day-to-day uh, -day work uh, became more varied. Um, I was managing the HIV and AIDS database, and this was um, surveillance of um, the treatment and care of all those people who are HIV positive uh, and the services they receive from the statutory and voluntary sector. And it gave me a good understanding of how we can turn uh, routine monitoring data into real intelligence that will influence policy and practice and applying that to drug use in general and not just as a passive monitoring but um, as being more proactive and seeing the trends of how things happen in geographies and how they change over time and what predictions we can make about the diffusion of practices over time and over geographies and between populations. Um, I worked on um, injecting drug use behaviour in relation to hepatitis C uh, and while this focus was on psychoactive drug users it was also some of the first cases of, of hepatitis C and anabolic steroid users being identified. I was able to apply these principles of public health to anabolic steroid use and recognise the need for, for greater understanding and, and evidence and information on key parameters. How many users are there? Who are they? Why are they doing it? Are they getting what they want from it? Um, and what are they, are they getting things they don't want from it? Uh, and what I did over time was start to, to track our, our development of our understanding. And what we can see is that um, while there has been progress in some cases, that progress has resulted in the realization that we don't know as much as we thought we did. Uh, and that can be true of um, the, our knowledge or understanding of the population and of the harms that they're experiencing. Um, I've highlighted yellow things that it's been my sort of privilege to, to work with colleagues and collaborate on and, and where I've managed to contribute to that understanding. Uh, and the arrows indicate where we've got ongoing research and, and that really excites me that at no point in the past has there been this level of research being conducted. And there's other research being conducted within the UK, uh, which I'm not involved in, uh, but uh, in the field, um, we, we've never had such a, a, an active development of the evidence base. Um, one of the key areas that I worked in was uh, looking at, or have worked in and continue to work in is looking at the characteristics. Some of those just basic uh, bits of information are really important. I mean, from a media perspective, you know, this is who we, we see as anabolic steroid users, you know, young men uh, um, aspiring for this um, body beautiful. Uh, more accurately, we should have him there as well, uh, because there's as many people over the age of 40 as under 25, or as, as indicated from our research. 
um, th this is um, a, a survey which we've run um, several times now across the United Kingdom with support from Public Health Wales uh, and uh, Josie Smith from Public Health Wales that has been um, inspirational in our dedication to this area so we, you know, I'm really grateful for that. Um, it's not just a UK phenomenon. Uh, Dominic Sago has clearly demonstrated that with, with his, his work over looking at um, the global epidemiology of use. And we contributed to that um, in work such as this, where we, we looked in detail, uh, scoping the, the evidence around uh, use within the Middle East. And in every country where they've looked for anabolic steroid use, they've found it. And that's regardless of uh, culture, religion, and uh, uh, demographics, you know, it, it's established it in all those uh, communities. Um, and it's not just a, 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 an injecting issue. Um, while most of the focus has been around injecting anabolic steroid users, we know that there's a, a significant minority, uh, but still substantial numbers of people who don't inject and who just use uh, oral products. And so therefore we need to make sure that services are developed for them as well. Um, important over the last decade has been the work of Asfest Christensen and his development of typologies. Um, together with um, uh, colleagues, he, he developed this typology, uh, and it, it, you can read about it in this recent book that has been published, uh, which is excellent uh, for getting an understanding of the population and the research that he's conducted. Um, he was able to produce these um, uh, pen portrait uh, of uh, of users uh, in different categories and uh, this is based on a, a qualitative work that him and his colleagues are, are, have worked on um, and it, it paints a picture of their characteristics their behaviors and the risks and therefore informing what we should do about it and this is you know really important work and what we wanted to do with colleagues in particular uh, I'd like to mention Rene Zarnow in, in, in Australia, was take our data, run a cluster analysis and see what came out from ours. And as it turned out, um, it, it went into four clusters uh, with very similar um, uh, characteristics and uh, uh, parameters as the work that uh, asking and colleagues. And while clearly um, you know, th th this is fluid and dynamic and uh, people will move between groups and, uh, and lie between groups and are sometimes a member of more than one group. And when we run this cluster analysis again, we may find there's five clusters. But it, what it does is it shows this um, diversity and that it's a heterogeneous population and our response has to reflect this. Uh, and th that has been a significant uh, piece of work. Um, the question, why do men use anabolic steroids? And I mean, on a superficial level, we've been trying to answer this for, for a long time. Um, most recently in our surveys, our iPad surveys, in which we can see the majority of users, you know, when asked to, to, to state a level of importance, you know, 10 out of 10 for importance for uh, development of body image and cosmetic reasons. Um, and that, that's quite predictable. But when you start to, to look a bit further, you'll see uh, that some people use it to um, maintain youth and vitality, to, to, to regain their youthful exuberance. Uh, but also this one's quite interesting. Um, we've got over a quarter of people stating 10 out of 10 for importance for sporting performance. And this is sporting performance other than bodybuilding. Um, and yet a third, it's of no importance whatsoever. So we can see you know, a definite split. And, and it, this just really reflects the, the diversity of this population and how we have to reflect that. Um, but what's behind this drive for muscularity? You know, we, we can uh, do surveys, but it doesn't really tell us, you know, what is driving this this use uh, and the reason for wanting a change in in, in appearance and it's very easy uh, to blame popular culture uh, and the media and we can do things like uh, as harrison pope in the states has uh, highlighted with gi joe we can do it with action man how this scrawny little plastic um 
doll has changed into a, a, a large plastic doll uh, and, and how muscular definition has become uh, important within um, uh, this sphere. Um, we can do it with uh, action heroes in uh, things like um, Star Wars. Um, uh, we can do it with superheroes. I, my favourite one is... And my favourite superhero it is, is Spider-Man. This is from the 1960s, uh, first edition. Um, and, and this is, um, it was a, no, he said a scrawny insect, a, a, scro a scrawny arachnid. Um, and you, you look at him now, you know, the, the physique on him, he looks like he could swing uh, on webs across the city and, and climb uh, tall buildings uh, just on his strength alone. Um, you can take it to, to to many areas of popular culture or things that interest you. My case, Doctor Who, he a scrawny man in a, a in a foil outfit, physique now massive. You can take it to real extremes. Dalek uh, in the past in the nineteen sixties, Dalek now with lats, and it it's complicated. And when you get put on the couch, that isn't the answer that is wanted by the media. They want um, a, a, a short short sharp answer um and it's not it's much more complex than that and it's nothing new that this influence and women have been exposed to um the the uh, fat shaming for, for this is from a hundred years ago um and it continues now and it's men being um i suppose exposed to these pressures as well um and, and our understanding, I think, is starting to improve and work of Sue Backhouse in terms of the dopogenic environment, um, which you can think of in terms of sport and within body image. You know, and you look at the work of um, uh, uh, Jeff Bates, uh, who we've collaborated with for, for many years, and, and what he's done is developed this uh, a sort of outline of those influence and factors from those internal drivers, uh, and even taking it before the, the genetics, um, right the way through uh, our social networks, the community groups that we may engage in, uh, through to that societal level. And it's all those things which impact on a decision-making uh, process uh, and the decision to use or not to use anabolic steroids. And really, if we're gonna be effective in changing behavior, we need to take those things into account. And why should we be concerned? Well, we've got good evidence for, for the harms that people experience uh, from the use of anabolic steroids. Not all people. And we don't know the exact reasons why some people, for what of a better expression, get away with uh, use for many years. But we do know that the more you use and the longer you use for, the more damage that will be done, uh, in particular on things like cardiovascular disease. And we've got new evidence emerging all the time and the key to this uh, example is, is the, the change to the cerebral cortex uh, and that impact on, on memory and cognitive function and that's work that's been led by uh, Astrid Björnebeck in uh, in Oslo and and I, I use this in an example where my, my wife Claire has uh, uh, said on many occasions you've worked on this for so long now hasn't it all been said uh, and the answer is no we're discovering new things all the time um, I think the population uh, and some of the issues are changing uh, over time as well. But what is key for me is that we're starting to get a better understanding and that can only happen with ongoing research. And I haven't really com contributed to, to the, the adverse effects in the way that um, some of the researchers have mentioned here, Harrison Pope and Ashley Bjornebeck. Uh, as with the work I've been involved in is more uh, the secondary um, issues or, or, or the once removed, the injecting injuries, adulterated products and polypharmacy. And it's been a privilege to uh, publish with a, a number of different colleagues on those issues. Um, uh, Viv Hope, uh, for I think it's about eight years now, we've collaborated uh, and he's led work around blood-borne viruses. And we identified in this paper, um, the, for the first time, significant levels of HIV amongst uh, injecting anabolic steroid users. And it's important, uh, I suppose this is an example, and I suppose something which um, a lesson that I've learned in how we deliver the results of research. Um, 
what I should have emphasised is that it's lumpy, the picture, not a good epidemiological term. But for some sections of anabolic steroid use, um, the, the virus isn't present. For some, it's quite high. And for everyone, there's a potential risk. But I suppose by identifying 2% of the anabolic steroid using population are HIV positive, that can um, uh, cause barriers. It can, um, I suppose, it depicts a world that certain sections of that population don't recognise and alienates uh, them from, from the research. And I suppose that is an example uh, of how we need to recognize the heterogeneity uh, and recognize the different communities of anabolic steroid users and how we engage with them. Um, work that I've been involved in around contaminants, this was a scoping review that my most read work, which was led by Claire Cole, um, and um, th this was looking at what's actually in drugs, in including uh, anabolic steroids, and it triggered an interest for, for other research which I've uh, conducted with, with um, different collaborators uh, uh, looking at the exact content of anabolic steroids. Um, and another piece uh, here with uh, Dominic Sago um, looking at um, all the different drugs that have been reported uh, being used by anabolic steroid users. I think the other contribu contribution I've made is to our overall understanding of human enhancement drugs in general, not just those drugs to enhance physique. This is work done with um, Michael Evans Brown, uh, where we look to classify the different types of enhancement drugs um, based on, on the function, the reasons that they're used for, and, and looked in detail. And this is one of my most cited pieces of work. And more recently, work with Katinka van der Van and um, uh, Carl Mulrooney, um, where we, we look to bring together some of the, the top um, authors uh, from around the world uh, to contribute to this uh, collection of um, essays and, and research around human enhancement drugs. I think what's excited me going forward, um, apart from that ongoing research that I mentioned, is the, the impact end of work uh, and the support that I've had from Manchester Met uh, on developing the Anabolic Steroids uh, UK network. Uh, and this is a network of academics. Um, we have um, over 50 UK academics representing 20 universities, and this is growing all the time. Uh, practitioners from um, services right the way across the country and uh, international uh, collaborators from um, 12 countries coming together with the idea of exchanging um, research, evidence, practice, understanding um, within this network uh, and under this, the steering of um, a, a steering group which includes users f and members of that gym community uh, to see how we best serve the population and how we best inform policy and practice. Now that's just coming together now um, but already as I say we, we've made great inroads and showed the appetite for um, bringing together research and delivering it effectively. Um, Linked in with that is um, a, a conference which again has been supported um, by Manchester Met and uh, other supporters which you, when you, you click on the website you'll see uh, the, the range of sponsors and supporters which I'm really grateful to. Um, and, and this um, conference brings together um, some of the top experts from and, and speakers from uh, around the world uh, to talk about the public health implications of anabolic steroid use. This, this is free. Um, it depends on when you're watching this. If you're watching this live, uh, it's on tomorrow, um, and I would recommend it. it. It's free to just log on and register. If you're watching this as a recording, the conference was great, and I recommend you you watch your, um, uh, the the feed of it, which is recorded on the on the website. Um, I'd like to finish there uh, and finally uh, again thank Manchester Metropolitan University. I, I moved to Manchester Met for, um, for several reasons. One of the main ones being um, it really attracted me to some, uh, a university with this real world approach and this focus on impact and its commitment to changing um, uh, society. Um, 
also to the actual research group I was joining, a selection of them there. Many of them are actually, um, one of their interests is, uh, and, and active areas of research is enhancement drugs. Um, but the key thing that they've all got in common and, and which attracted me to it is, is twofold. One is their commitment to engage, engaging with the community themselves and making sure that it's a real voice from that community or from those communities which we engage with. And the other thing is impact and making sure that it's relevant to policy and practice. So finally, uh, I'd just like to give recognition to all the research and practitioners who I haven't mentioned and who've inspired me. And to also thank all those steroids users um, uh, for, who've given me their time, trust and patience over the years. Um, and most importantly, to, to, to thank these, uh, my wife Claire and daughters Chloe and Katie uh, for all their support uh, over the years uh, and their love and, uh, and care. And uh, giving the final word to Ergenia and Loki uh, for being great dogs. Um, thank you very much for your time.